What's going on, everybody? How you doing? In today's video, we are checking out an interview with Neil Peart on the Strombo Show doing the moving pictures track by track. Wow, I figured I'd throw this in there. Why not? You know what it is. It's going to be awesome. If you're new here, please subscribe. Check out my videos, all kinds of videos, reaction videos, bass videos, music videos. Check it out. If you like the channel, you want to support the channel, you can hit super thanks underneath this video. You can hit me direct in the description. I got PayPal, Cash App, Venmo, Amazon wishlist, mailing address, and I do donation requests. So if there's something you want me to listen to, watch, talk about, hit me direct, PayPal, Cash App, Venmo. In the notes section, leave a link, leave a description. Let me know what you want the video to be on, and I'll make the video. You can also email me at jpanreadsemail at gmail.com. Thank you guys. All right, let's get to this. Neil Peart, moving pictures, track by track, Strombo show. Bam. All right, so here we are with Neil Peart of Rush. Um, and uh, you've got the 30th anniversary of this edition, uh, edition of this record coming out uh, in mid-April, which is pretty exciting. So I wanted to, uh, to go track by track with you on moving pictures, okay. if we can. I mean, what do you remember from the time that you guys made this record? Um, so much, really. Uh, it was a great summer, for example, when we were doing the songwriting. We'd rented Ronnie Hawkins' farm up near Peterborough, and so there was the classic set up in the barn, you know, um, and... Uh, start working on new material and there was a little cottage on a little lake where I was working on lyrics during the day and then we'd regroup later in the day and uh, we were staying up there and, and uh, going home on weekends so that perfect kind of a combination of a home life as well as professional life and just in a, in a great state of mind by that time we'd been together for six years um, and had had enough success to establish us at where uh, the industry wasn't leaning us on us anymore about what we were going to do and um, there was a real maturity coming of age for us as a band because we've been doing so much experimenting of all kinds as individual instrumentalists and as a group of instrumentalists of coming up with like puzzles, solving puzzles of playing in odd times and putting big long epics together. And they were for a reason, you know, they were pure exuberance. There was nothing in self-indulgence or so-called pretentiousness about it. It was true boyish enthusiasm that was involved in creating all those things. But then we started whittling them down and the changes around us are important too in the late 70s and we were young enough and fan enough to be part of that and, and to respond to when punk became new wave when the punk musicians started to get better Stuart Copeland was telling me a little while ago that uh, being around that scene at the time he would say he would see the Sex Pistols bass player looking over sting shoulders just figure out what notes go with what notes yeah. it's inevitable that you want to get better I think no matter what you do you know even if you're a punk with an attitude right. you play that thing every night you're going to get better <laughs> right. and uh, so we had uh, we had responded to that positively and mentioning the police we're big fans of them I'd been a reggae fan for a long time and I listened to modern radio at the time, and the uh, the new wave was becoming the new romantics and all these things at that time. And we soaked it all up. And uh, that brought a concision to our arranging, but no less indulgence in that sense. You know, we still wanted it to be hard to play. And something I've realized over the years, those every one of those songs was designed to play live. We were a live band. That's all we did. And when I put a drum part together, it was designed, designed to be progressive in the, in the architecture sense and to be challenging enough to play night after night for who knew 30 years right. you know we're playing this whole album now 30 years later without cynicism you know still liking to play those songs and still proud of them so um, that's a lovely way and it's it's a fulfillment of the sincerity that was brought to that music at the time and the honest growth you know people joke about progressive bands and something but we were progressing and learning you know and developing and developing taste at the same time okay maybe that giant seven eight um, instrumental maybe we could soak that down to you know a little <laughs> fraction it would still be good and still be exciting and it was sure. you know those were the lessons we were learning so um, that was an important time musically around us and a great time for the three of us in terms of getting along and sharing our goals and having a good time and, and uh, making the music so as we go track by track on moving pictures then yeah. what's the first song that that was done <laughs> See, I, that kind of history hasn't been um, <laughs> captured but I, I kind of think it was maybe uh, limelight or um, uh, Red Barchetta, why was that? I know Tom Sawyer came later because uh, we'd been touring a lot with Max Webster, another Toronto band at that time. Did Pai Dubois help with that? And Pai Dubois, as a lyricist, uh, he and I got along. He gave me so many great books. A mm. um, big pile of books by John Barth, a big pile of books by Lawrence Durrell, and all this great reading that he turned, on to me, turned me on to, for one thing, in the years when I was trying to find a life in touring, because yeah. I didn't find it much of a life. And at first, a reading, uh, a reading hermit became my first evolution of that, and then later, bicyclist and motorcyclist. But Pai had a strange way of writing in these exercise books that were just laden with this street-edgy kind of um, a lyricist 
lyricism imagery, and he worked part time in an um, insane asylum, you know, and <laughs> he had a lot of different influences than I did, and they were, they were kind of formless, but I, I'm good at imposing form, so it, it made it a great combination where I could extrapolate uh, really good passages for him and give them shape into a song, and then pass them over to Getty, who could make them singable, mm. and uh, it, it affected us in a way musically, too. I have to think the first time that we collaborated with, um, with Pi like that, it gave a certain edge to the music and a certain Max Webster influence in a way too that was that pushed us a different way and one of the tricks we were already using then that we still do is we make up other bands okay today right. we're not rush we're the fabulous men that was our new age band yeah, right. but we have an ongoing edgy uh, kind of rockabilly band called rock and f yeah. so when we want to bring out a different persona we say okay make this part rock and f <laughs> that's something we still use and like the, the uh, not to jump ahead too much but the song vital signs on this that was definitely the fabulous man for sure and there, you hear the reggae influence as well yeah i saw vital signs all right so tell me so that's vital science let's go to the top tell me about tom sawyer yeah the, the legend is it was an accidental discovery of a sound on a keyboard and there we go all that uh, was part of it but again we're working in a barn you know we have to set up the bucolic atmosphere of it all and, and we're just experimenting with zero pressure yeah. and we're just spending time there during the week all together and then home and weekends and um so it was a, a true ferment um of fun, you know, because there were, no, again, no consequences. We were improvising and putting things together, all in the room together, too, in those days. So it was very organic also. And those were building. And another important part of a song like um, Tom Sawyer, and any of these, really, I said they were designed to be played live. And they were also played live many times before they were recorded. So the kind of detail that went into the drum part, for example, I haven't changed barely a note, maybe one fill in Tom Sawyer in 30 years, because it's still challenging and satisfying to play just how I made it up, you know. And, and that's nice. There are other songs that I have changed from time to time, or newer ones. Actually, I'll deliberately design to be freer in my new improvisational mode. But in that day, we played those songs over and over, and we recorded them until all of us played it right. Yeah. You know, so necessarily they were played enough times that each time I might add a little detail or a little f echo this little uh, rhythmic pattern in the next verse and, and build that way architecturally and progress up the song. And people often ask me why I build a drum part that way. Well, it's a performance. You know, I started off sim simple. For the listener's sake, this is something I learned in writing too, and this song is a great example. First, um, what does the listener need to know? And they teach you that in writing class, what does the reader need to know? So I state a rhythm as strongly as I can, whether it's a straightforward backbeat four like Tom Sawyer is, or something more complicated. When I first state that, I try to make it as clear as I can for the listener. Occasionally trick them on purpose, the turnaround things that you do deliberately because they're fun for musician listener. But for the most part, like in prose, I have to decide what the reader needs to know first to get the picture I'm trying to send. Drummer, I'm uh, drumming exactly the same. Here's the rhythm, and now here's all the ways I'm going to play with it. But first I want to state it clearly, and this song is a perfect example of laying it down. Wait, tell me about Red Barchetta. Yeah, that uh, came about um, a magazine story that I'd read some years earlier that I really liked. It was set in the future dystopia when motorized vehicles were, were banned. And uh, oh so I just had an idea that it might make an, a neat little video visual song, and we were into a lot of soundtrack mode at that time, too. Getty was always a big music fan, and we often thought in terms of making the music tell part of the story, something that still engages us now. So that song's very much an yeah. example of a cinematic oh, song yeah. for us, where the moods and the rhythms go up and down dynamically and shift uh, urgency, all for the purpose of echoing the drama of a little story. Now, if, and I, I stress the word if, but if Toronto successfully secedes from Canada, how would you feel about YYZ being the anthem <laughs> for that new city country? What yeah, like, talk about organic uh, relief. That came in flying in one time when we were in a small plane and, and hearing from the cockpit the Morse code rhythm. And I said, oh, wouldn't that be a neat introduction? And then cinematically, again, a perfect example, we thought we'll make this, this song's an instrumental, but it's about YYZ Airport. It's about airports. So we have kind of the exotic moods shifting around all this and then the gigantic uh, emotional sort of crescendo of people being reunited and being separated and all that. So it was very consciously a kind of a playful cinematic twist on an airport. I think Primus has covered it. Um, I think also Muse has covered it. When you, when you, when you hear covers of Rush songs, I like, know. you know, Asia, not, not, not the same. It's very different. Yeah. <laughs> very so it be, yeah. uh, Limelight, let's talk about Limelight. A lot's made about that because a lot, of it, a lot was then made about your relationship with your fans when they read that song. Mm. So w tell me what, the, what, what it was like making that song. Um, yeah, it was just my attempt really to... Um, uh, explain how it felt, you know, that, that's really how it was. And I, I 
tried to explain that introverts do not understand, or extroverts do not understand introverts. The idea of being shy to them is some kind of poison. If you think back to school days, I read a quote recently that all of us are the people that high school made us. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and if shy people in high school, I remember they're stuck up. They're conceited. They think they're better, you know, just for being shy. So that's a, that persists. And if you are that way in a public field, unfortunately, it's a huge disadvantage, but it just made me uncomfortable and embarrassed. And I just tried to explain. And I can't tell you how many younger musicians, authors and athletes and actors have come up to me in, in life and said what that song came to mean. Suddenly they understood, I can't pretend a stranger is a long-awaited friend. Michael Chabon, the author, just said that to me recently when he had a book signing and with all this expectation of people thinking they know him and his work so well and he doesn't know them at all. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, it's a real disadvantage. And I, there's an old English expression when somebody calls your name, say, hey, George. You have me at a disadvantage, and it is. I don't know you, you know. So anyway, I, I was just trying in a really neutral sort of way, and, and uh, um, hopefully a, a poetic sort of way, just to explain how it felt and hey, what mattered. You know, really, what mattered to us was always the music. The, what uh, the, it was to be, not to seem. Well, speaking of high school, you, the, the great irony and the great victory for you then is um, you're the guy that played the hockey night in Canada team when it went to TSA. I would take that bullies from 50 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> hockey was not your thing necessarily. Uh, well, uh, I, I, I described it as being intravenously. Of course, I grew up in southern Ontario. Hockey was part of life six months of the year. But I was never, I, uh, in the skates of those days, my little feet were like this. So. <laughs> um, the camera eye. Um, title from a John Dos Passos novel of the 1930s, which was very experimental. And he used segments in it like newsreel to describe the events of the day that were affecting his characters. And another one was a, a kind of stream of consciousness called The Camera Eye, where he panned across the, the Depression America, and especially on the industrial side, and just reported what he saw, the objective camera eye. And I kind of loved that. And a John Steinbeck quote about every city having a unique quality of light is another... Um, uh, influence in that song. They're both personal experience and that was where I was learning to uh, wed experience and the universal too. I was writing about um, uh, being in New York on tour probably but walking around in the spring rainfall that felt kind of lo like London and I'd spent an important part of my youth uh, around 19, 20, 21 years old in London uh, struggling for fame and fortune. I didn't know it was in Toronto. I thought it was in London. Nobody knew it was in Toronto, <laughs> Nobody man. knew it was in Toronto. Even Neil Young sure. left. Nobody that's, knew it was here. That's for sure, yeah. So I, I'd, I'd spent quite an important part of my time in, in London, so I was writing about two powerful uh, first-hand personal experiences, but putting them into images that I had found um, from other authors to be universal and something that was translatable. The, um, it, it's an important song that kicks off side two of the record, and now people don't even really, only purists really get vinyl now. So when you make a record, do you think about what would be side two and all that? And we still do, you know. Yeah, it used to be such a nice part. It was like making up two sets. Yeah. You know, the, the sequence of songs could be two sets um, in, in a show. And mm. that's certainly the way we always thought of him. And we hated losing the, the last song on side one because it had a certain conclusiveness about it. And we hated losing the opening song on side two. Well, adapt or perish, you know. One thing we've right. always done is adapt to the world around us. And we are now to the way the, the music business is um, so yeah that's uh, it's, it's unfortunate but it's like lamenting the, the 12 inch sleeve that was an awful much nicer platform to work on too for art direction but right is what it was it is what it was, it is what it was. <laughs> it's quite a it's quite a photo though I mean I love the fact that you got 2112 and dogs playing poker on the cover <laughs> well they're moving pictures yeah they are moving pictures that's absolutely <laughs> true um, witch hunt when you watch the news today do you go wow witch hunt was really ahead of the curve um, yeah and, and it was of course reacting to the same sort of model mob mentality back in those days. In fact, we were the howling mob out in the snow up at uh, the studio in Quebec. I was the rabble rouser too out there. We have to protect our children and, and uh, rah, rah, this big uproar behind the intro of the song. But that was one of the, pretty well every album in those days we would make a production number that we didn't have to play live because we were quite disciplined about being able to reproduce the songs as they were in our individual parts and the overall production. So we would set aside that discipline for one song and, and this one, all the overdubs on it and double track drums and, and keyboards and stuff that later technology made possible. And now, like, the, the overdubbed intro drum-wise has a cowbell playing, different tom-toms, um, a conga, and um, electronic toms and all that. So to play it live, I'm playing the cowbell with my foot mm -hmm. and, you know, the uh, trigger pads to do the, the electronic drums and stuff. So technology, and Getty has MIDI now to do the keyboard parts live. So it was ironic that we were just a little ahead of our own curve technologically, and later it caught up, and now we can reproduce pretty well anything we do. Have you you guys ever outthought yourself with all the technology and the, and the multiple oh, drum kits? Oh, we always kit? are. Oh, we got tortured by technology <laughs> because, you know, we're always trying out everything as it comes along and the 
the the lack of reliability and mm -hmm. uh, back in the, uh, the spirit of radio has a sequencer in it, 1979. So I had to be able to hear that every night on stage and play along to it. And so it had to be loud enough to make me deaf. And also uh, <laughs> I had to play accurately enough tempo wise. The whole song goes by and then the chorus comes and it has to be in and out right. So that mm. was a great exercise of discipline that has served me really well to learn to manipulate time and to maybe push the tempo a little bit, but still when that sequencer arrives or the various effects that we use nowadays that are time uh, relevant, I have to be with them you sure. know, when it gets there. We've already talked about vital signs, so I'll wrap on this. Now that you're playing this whole record again, what's the one part, if somebody's in the audience, they know that Neil just can't wait to get to? There's one part in one of those songs where in your mind you're like, I can't wait to hit that note. <laughs> Every song has that, I'm glad to say, and, and lo a lot of them, though, because they're so hard, um, the, the, what sustains that tension for a performer every night is because you're not sure if you're going to be able to do it. I'm sure that's it. And I, I mentioned before, Tom Sawyer remains so difficult to play. Although it seems a slow tempo, my right hand most of the time is going about as fast as it'll go, and every beat is full force. Foot, you know, my feet and hands are playing full force for that whole song. So just to execute it with strength and smoothness, and I mentioned that duality before is something that I've worked all these years in drumming 40, 40 million years of <laughs> wanting to combine those elements of first I wanted technique and you work all hard on technique and then I wanted accuracy at all strength working in the studio with click track sequences accuracy was the, the gold standard and then I wanted feel and now I want that combination when I play these songs now I know I bring a better feel to them than I did then you know I have the strength and power and the speed but so much more subtle control of time uh, and that's the rewarding thing again we're in the middle of re rehearsing these songs playing them every day right now after all these years and I still find myself getting inside them in that rhythmic way and feeling them in, in more subtle and, and thus you know more rewarding ways cool yeah yeah I mean there it is right yeah not much to say about it it's it's uh it's exactly you know what he's saying it, it, you know I mean the best part of it is just just listening to the guy talk right um, I thought the interesting parts were talking about Pai de Bois. I would say that that was certainly interesting. Yeah. Aside from that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's what it is. I don't feel like he talked that much about, I, I feel like they just like skipped over vital signs just because he brought it up, you know, early on. But I'm like, what did you say about vital signs? Did I miss something? <laughs> um, yeah, I missed what you said about vital signs. Anyways, it was cool. Dig it. The camera eye, that's a track that I haven't heard in a while. Because I've heard, I've heard uh, you know, all these other tracks. I've heard plenty of times. But the camera eye, for whatever reason, has come up the least. I feel like I need to go back and listen to that. Cool. Yeah, wow. Quick little, uh, quick little extra over here, huh? Yeah, moving pictures track by track. Awesome. Thank you, guys. I'll catch you in the next video.